All right, line A4, learning task number nine. We're going to be taking a look at describing reasons for power factor correction. It's a relatively short little learning task inside of here. You should have read through it in, you know, probably about five, ten minutes last night. Um, we're going to spend a little bit longer on it, yet we have a bunch of calculations and things like that that we're going to do to prove a lot of the concepts that we have inside of here. But right now, we're just going to start by explaining what it is that we're trying to go and do. First of all, at the very top of that learning task, your second paragraph down talks about the fact that um, we've got a lot of equipment that's going to be out there. They list off induction motors, fluorescent or HID, that's like your high pressure sodium, you know, any of those uh, metal halide type of bulbs that you're going to have. A lot of LED that runs off of high voltage ballasts, uh, arc welders, transformers, generators, things like that that are all going to be inducted. And as a result of their inductance, they need the magnetism in order to go and operate. They are going to go and cause a lagging power factor. Now we do get penalties from BC Hydro anytime that we have got a lagging power factor. And if you go into your modules, uh, or onto your online learning modules, inside of this week, you'll see that I posted up a PDF from BC Hydro. Let's take a quick look at that. It talks about power quality, power factor, wiring, and service, and how that is going to go and affect, you know, what your relationship is like with BC Hydro, aka, are they going to charge you lots of money or very little? And they go through a bunch of stuff on kind of what power factor is, look at that, you know, all formulas that we've seen over here, power factor, kilowatts, K bars, things like that, you know, we've seen uh, stuff, this is supposed to say real power, by the way, uh, you know, magnetizing K bars, etc. And then they talk about, you know, what causes these things, lighting, general power, and industrial services. And there's a bunch of things that we want to go and highlight out of this. Over here, they show somebody doing a test, you'll see that they've got all their arc shields in place, they're wearing their proper PPE for the arc flash hazard, etc. Um, but over here is an important sentence over here. The average lagging power factor should not be less than 90%. And BC Hydro, underneath that, it says may take continuous tests of power factor, that's what they're doing now with these electronic meters, or may test the customer's power factor at any reasonable time. If the customer's power factor is lower, scroll back up here right now then 90 percent the customer will be required to install power factor corrective equipment satisfactory to bc hydro at the customer's expense it's what this is one of those things that you know hey we're going to go and sell you power but you got to hold up your end of the deal because it affects everybody else that's going to be out there we're going to see that when we get into transformers uh they go and penalize anybody and they require you to go and have that you know above 90 percent it says, if you hire a new um, or existing customers that requires KVAR hour metering for the first time, they're going to allow 135 days, if necessary, for correcting the power factor after installation of the measuring equipment. In other words, once you go online, you're going to be allowed up to 135 days of, you know, poor power factor before they say, okay, you know, time to snap out of this and let's get this thing into there. They then talk about, you know, uh, if there's loads, you know, that you're going to be changing the customer. Uh, is expected to assess in advance the needed correction. Guess who the customer is going to rely on to do that assessment? It is going to go and be you as the electrician that needs to go and assess that. You are not automatically allowed a further 135 days. So if you are adding something onto it, use the electrician. Don't get that grace period. If you have got them already metering, which they're all doing at this point using those electronic meters, they spit out numbers for KVA, K bars, and watts, if you ever watch them, uh, then that means that you are not allowed that further 135 days. You have to do this thing correctly. If your customer with a low power factor neglects or refuses to install the power factor corrective equipment, BC Hyder may do one of three things. They can disconnect service. Okay. They can require payment of an additional 50 cents per watts, uh, months per 100 watts. You got to remember that we're usually running hydro around, you know, between, depends upon what the installation is, uh, but anywhere between, you know, 12 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Now, this is a tenth of a kilowatt, that's 100 watts, right? Which means that really it's $5 a kilowatt hour is going to be the surcharge. That is crazy. You take a look at your kilowatt hours uh, and you multiply that by $5 a kilowatt hour. That's incredibly uh, large, you know, monetary penalty. They're allowed to go and do that. Or they're allowed to go and apply a surcharge to the total bill. 
Usually what they're going to do is they're going to start with the surcharge. Uh, we'll calculate those in a second. And then they're going to go and say, well, if you're not listening to the surcharge, we're not going to go and put it up to $5 per kilowatt hour. That's their maximum that they're allowed to charge. And if you're still not listening, they're just going to disconnect service at that point. So we're going to go down into here. Uh, this chart over here talks about what their surcharge percent is going to go and be. You'll note that right over here is the 90% off of that graph. That 90% shows us that we are at a zero power factor. Everything else after that now is going to go and go up. I've turned off the highlighter here so we can see, but we see by the time we got down to 89%, that's only one below. We're at 2%, 88. We're still going to be at the 2%. We drop down to 87. We go up to 4. So between 87 to 85, it's going to be over there. Anywhere from 84 to 80, it's going to be 9%, etc., etc., etc. So by the time you start getting down to, you know, like a 75% power factor that you're going to have, you got a 16% surcharge that's just going to be added onto your bill at the end of the uh, day. As it gets worse and worse, and you'll note that they quit here. By the time that they get down to 50%, they're up to this 80%, and after that, they're just going to go straight to that, you know, 5%. they are not going to go down past that 50%. They're going to just say, look, you know, they get this thing fixed up. They talk then about, you know, uh, estimation of power factor if the kilowatt hours are known. Then they talk about power factor uh, correction systems. Um, they're going to go and require you as the customer to go and put it in. And then they talk about over here the same thing that's inside of our module over here, that these are the major sources of lagging power factor. Motors, lots of electric motors. Transformers, if we're doing lots of high voltage down to low voltage, back up to high voltage, etc. Welding machines, those things are notorious. You know, not gas welding, obviously, but uh, electric arc welding. Induction heating coils, which we use in some industrial applications, and lighting ballasts are all going to be part of it. Generally, factors affecting the power factor of induction motor are going to be size, speed, and load. The larger the motor and the faster its speed, the higher the full load power factor. The power factor of a motor varies according to its load. The higher the percentage of the rated load, the higher the power factor. We're going to see this stuff when we go into the third year motor uh, thing. But for now, you need to know that if a customer says, hey, I need to go and have a motor over here, and you do the whole torque calculations to go and figure out, you know, what's your RPM, your torque, and things like that. And you figure that they're going to need a 10 horse motor, but you happen to have a 20 horse sitting around, don't sell them the 20 horse. Because they should be using that 10 horse. The 10 horse is going to be utilized to its maximum. Otherwise, you're magnetizing for 20 horse, but you're only delivering out you know, 10 horse for it. Which means you're going to go and have a wicked low power factor from that motor. So you want to try and use your motors as close to the line as is possible. After that, they go into you know a bunch of stuff there on you know, methods of correction. We're going to take a look at all of that. Synchronous motors, which is something that you're going to learn about in third year, also referred to as synchronous power factors. Uh, and then they talk about you know some benefits and things like that. They give you a whole set of charts inside of here as well for improvement. Now these are you know charts for people that don't know what they're doing, uh, but it's going to be multipliers. This will be like for people like engineers that might not be able to go and do the calculations the way we are doing. I'm not joking. I have run into this problem numerous times. Engineers work off of charts. You know, if you ask an engineer how to calculate the volume of a ball, they're going to go and look, look for a chart on what the volume of that ball is. They don't actually, you know, air, go to the side of mathematics uh, for a school. They just love their charts. So these are what they're going to go and use. We're not going to use these inside of our calculations. I'm not even going to bother uh, in taking a look at what those ones are. This is going to be a big thing we will want to know about, released system capacity. In other words, when we have got a poor power factor, we are going to go and have bound up system capacity. And if we can go and fix our system, what we're going to be able to do is we are going to be able to go and increase a bunch of the KVA that we can deliver to other loads. So, you know, maybe your customer might not have to do a service upgrade if you go and correct the power factor. I, it sounds cheesy, you know, when you look at it, everybody's like, yeah, right, you know, that's never going to be the case. Trust me, I have done this before and I have won bids off of it when I had my own electrical company. You know, I had a customer that was doing a large addition to a food processing plant. It was an older food processing plant. And uh, this was in the days before Hydro was doing a lot of power factor, you know, calculations. And they just had an old plant with, you know, multiple buildings, multiple transformers, lots of induction lighting. 
As a result of that, they had a poor power factor. Hydro hadn't popped that yet, and so Hydro you know, was not monitoring that, but they wanted to go and add in a whole separate process system. And the size of the process system would require a service upgrade. You know, there's no way about it. When most people looked at it, they said, look, this is what your system is right now. This is how many amps you're running continuously. This is the size of the system. I went in there and I rented, uh, well, rented, I rented for a case of beer from a friend of mine, a power factor, uh, our power quality analyzer, which allows me to go and test for power factor and things like that. I put that thing on, I took a look at what the power quality was and the power factor, and I realized that if I could correct their power factor, we could easily fit all that additional load on there because the additional load was just a hair over what you know you would be required to go and kick up to the next service. So I put in my quote, a couple of other companies put in their quotes, their quotes had, you know, shutdowns and BC Hydro and things like that. I put in mine, I was still fairly, you know, uh, like I, I didn't go super aggressive on the price because I knew I was quoting against a bunch of people that were just going to go and do a system upgrade. When I did put my quote in, I got a call back from the customer that said, either you're an idiot or, uh, you know, you've got some way that you're going to make this happen because I'm picking your price because it's way lower than everybody else. And then they asked me what was going on. And I just explained, you know, well, this is why what we're doing, we're going to go and correct your power factor. Once we bring that power factor back down, then we've got release system capability. We don't need to get new hydro in. We don't need to do a shutdown. We don't need to do any of this other stuff. And a uh, customer said, well, you sure about this? I said, yeah, I'm sure about it. The math all checks out. And the customer said, go ahead. You know, you you go ahead with this one. You've got that one. It was a good job. We made good money off of that so one. And the customer at the end was very happy. And the thing has been running, you know, ever since. This is going back now about... I don't know, maybe 10, 10 ish years, something like that, that that thing's uh, got to be running, maybe 12 almost by now. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, but, anyways, it was a fairly significant release of system capacity that we had inside of there, which just allowed me to go and do stuff that other electricians who, you know, had bothered, hadn't bothered to remember anything, had forgotten all about. It wasn't a lot of work, honestly. All I had to do was go and rent that meter, put that meter on, leave it running for a week in their electrical room, come back, take a look at the readings, and I could go and see what I needed. And then it was just a matter of sending that off to power factor um, calculations. There's companies that their whole business is doing those power factor calculations. Anyways, that's, you know, obviously a, uh, you know, a little bit of an anomaly. You're not going to get that on everyone, but do check that. If you're going to be looking at doing a service upgrade, make sure that you can't just do at the additional load by releasing system capacity. All right, going through the rest of this one over here, there's a bunch more information. I would suggest once again that you do read this whole uh, one. It's industry, you know, this is from BC Hydro themselves uh, and what they actually require from us. So take a look through it. This is one of the big reasons, especially that monetary penalty and the fact that your customer can get disconnected otherwise that we want to have these in there. All right, back to this one over here. All right, back into the binder there. Uh, there's those four bullet points over there. You should know that these are the reasons for power factor correction. You should be able to explain this to a customer. You know, the fact that there's going to be reduced energy costs since your customer will get a ridiculously large bill if they've got too much magnetization, particularly places that run seasonally. You know, if they have got seasonal loads that will be heavily used, you know, motors and transformers and things like that, but then they shut it all off. They just kind of leave the system idling with all the transformers just, you know, uh, still booted up. Then they are going to go and see usual um, just bills that are going to come through that are going to have a surcharge on. Now, it's going to be a large surcharge on a small amount of power, but it can still go and add up. I think I shared that story with you earlier in this course about that customer of mine that had uh, just a irrigation service. You know, these are services that are built uh, specifically for the purpose of irrigating a field. They're designed to be used on a seasonal type of basis. And they had this irrigation shed. They had problems with bicycle bandits, you know, breaking in and taking copper out of that thing. So they put an alarm system on it. And as a result of that alarm system being on, they had to maintain power to it. Other years, they would always just go and shut off the main power to that entire shed all winter long. It was fine, you know, it could just go and stay off, but now they needed to keep it on so that they could go and drop from the 600 volt service that they had down to 120 volts so that they could go and operate that uh, security system inside there. Security system that was inside of there only took a few milliamps to go and run. I mean, it was monitoring just a tiny little shed uh, over there and an auto dialer, that was it. 
So when they left their large transformer, this was a couple hundred kVA transformer because they had some 208 volts, you know, irrigation uh, pumps that they had inside of there, as well as some of the 600 volts ones. As soon as they left that thing idling along at a couple hundred kVA, only developing only a few small watts, uh, they had just a ridiculously low power factor. And he ended up with that three grand bill roughly around there. I can't remember. I wish I'd kept a picture of that bill because it was a, just a crazy bill. He phoned me all up, you know, freaking out, wondering what was going on with his electricity because it had been off all winter and he had a three grand bill for the power. Uh, I took a look through the the bill. And this is back in the days before everybody had camera phones. We could just email or, you know, text the picture over there. I came over, we sat down, took a look, and I explained exactly what was going on. Uh, he was pissed, but, you know, that just the way that things are. So we put a much smaller, you know, 600 to 120 volt transformer onto the system. We put another switch on, another smaller transformer, just to go and run that. And we're talking like you, maybe a, a 1VA type of transformer. Anyways, it can go and, you know, cause massive energy costs. That increase in system capacity, the fact that if we free up some is going to be better. The other thing that's not really talked about much is going to be the increase in distribution efficiency. In other words, how far and how well I can go and transfer my voltage across stuff. Over here, they're showing us two identical loads. One of these is going to be a 1200 watt load that we're doing. This is the actual physical work. The other one's going to be 1200 watts. But the big difference between these two is going to go and be the power factor that we are going to go and have. This one here has got a 100% power factor, which means that my VA is going to be equal to my watts. So I've got 1200 watts. That is going to be my total VA. 1200 VA. This one over here has got a power factor of 50%. So if I go and take my watts divided by my power factor, that is going to go and equal my VA. So I take 1200 divided by 0.5. kicks me out to 2400 VA. 2400 VA, and you just take that VA and you divide it out by the voltage over there. Divide by number 20. You see that we end up with a line current of 20 amperes. That's where they're getting all these values here from. Now, if I compare from circuit to circuit, I see that both circuits are doing the exact same amount of useful work that I'm going to get over here. If they're both doing the exact same amount of useful work, my customer likes both of those circuits just the same. The problem is that this one over here, I'm going to be paying because I pay based upon the VA, not upon the wants. This is what Hydro does, is they just have an ammeter and a voltmeter. That's what their meters actually are designed to do. They bill you based upon the VA that you take into your facility. So I'm paying double to go and run this system, even though it's doing the same amount. The other problem is that I have now got my IR that is going to be increased. Let's go and give each of our lines over here a one ohm resistance. We're going to say that all the copper inside of this entire circuit is a grand total of one ohm. Okay, same with this one over here. We're going to use the exact same copper conductor inside of it. If we have got a one ohm resistance, we can go and say that V is equal to I times R. So in this case, with the one ohm resistance, get out of the way there, uh, I'm going to go and see that I would be dropping a grand total of 10 volts across all of my lines. This is common. We're used to voltage drop happening, which would mean that really this load over here is operating at 110 volts that it would be getting out of it. This one over here the exact same copper inside of there, V is equal to I times R, 1 ohm multiplied by 20 amps means that this thing is now going to be operating at 100 volts. We're losing an additional 10 volts of this thing. This is always bad for our system to lose values of voltage out of it. Uh, it's just some types of uh, loads are going to shut off automatically. A lot of your computerized types of load, programmable logic controllers, industrial equipment controls, computers, even some of your LED uh, driven balance and stuff will shut off if the voltage goes too low. They just shut off because it's not healthy for them uh, for a variety of different reasons. And as a result, you know, we get these twitchy voltages where sometimes stuff is just randomly shutting on and off because we've got too much line drop inside there. If we go and fix this one over here, if I can go and take what I've got happening inside of here and make this like that, then I'm going to have done what's called power factor improving. And really what I would be doing is if I've got an inductive load 
I'm going to have to add another capacitor onto the system. That capacitor then is still going to go and uh, carry current, but now what's going to happen is this current up here is going to go and drop. If I can improve to 100% power factor, what I'll see is that I'm going to go and be sending 10 amps through this loop over here, and the other 10 amps is going to be coming through here. My voltage drop is also going to go up, you know, it's, or go down. We're going to be up to 110 volts that's going to be on top of it. Ultimately, inside of these lines over here, I'm still going to be uh, drawing that 20 amps. My power factor correction does not change the load itself. It doesn't change what's the load, but it changes its effect on the system. It basically carries some of that load for my system. Yes, we do get, when we initially charge up, we're going to get an initial rush of current to charge those caps. But once those caps are charged, they're going to take care of, you know, 10 of the amps. This is going to take care of 10 of the amps. So we are going to go and have this current drop down to 10 amperes, which means that this VA is going to be dropped down to 1200 VA. Other than that little blip of current to charge that cap up, it's going to operate, you know, 24 hours now at 1200 VA. How do we do that? Well, what we have to do is we have to, have to, have to, have to go and add in bars. The bars are what we are going to go and use to cancel. We are not going to go and use the XL or the XC. We took a look at that inside of the previous learning task, how we try to calculate using XL and XC. It doesn't work when we've got a compound type of circuit, a series parallel type of circuit. So although matching XL and XC works for a series circuit, you know, I know that we don't use a lot of series circuits. So we're not going to go and use that XLXC thing. That would just be crazy. We don't build those circuits, so let's not try to use that math. What math we are going to use is always, always, always going to go and be this good math over here where we are going to work off of power, which is lovely anyways, because power is not going to go and lie to us. Okay, we do have to be careful as well about overcorrecting a power factor. I can't just go out there and say, well, I've got a crap power factor. I'm going to go to a just a big old capacitor that I found over here or bought at an auction or whatever, and I'm just going to check it on the system, and we'll call that thing good. That is going to be called overcorrecting the power factor. This was a lagging power factor. If I put too much caps on here, we'll just add in a bunch of caps. If I put too much capacitance onto here, what I'm going to do is now I'm going to go to a leading power factor, which means that now I'm going to go and have to supply power, VAR's power, to these as well. So I'm going to go back up to my amps. Really what we are seeing is we are seeing our line current drop and rise back up. It looks like a tuning curve. Honestly, 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 it does look like a tuning curve when you take a look at it. This point over here would be my resonance. This point over here is where we want to go and be. We want to be leading, uh, going into this, this curve. I shouldn't use that term leading. Uh, but I want to be going into this. I want to still be lagging, but I don't want to go into this leading power factor. Overcorrecting into a leading power factor is going to go and cause one huge thing. Other than the fact that, first of all, we're going to have a bad power factor and we're going to be, you know, uh, getting billed again. Overcorrection leads to increased, you need to write this down, increased transformer I was going to write voltage. I was going to start writing voltage for some reason. Voltage that we will have. Increased transform voltage is bad. That's what causes stuff to go and burn out. So do not, do not, do not overcorrect your power factor. Okay, last uh, line in that learning test, it just says that power factor correction has no effect on the load itself. We saw that in what we were just doing there before with the single cap, you know, correcting this thing. We saw that that line was still going to go and have 20 amps inside of it. The load was still going to go and have this. But by me power factor correcting, I can take care of feeding the load from two ends like this. You know, I'm going to feed part from the cap, part from my supply over here. All right, for a page and a half learning test, that's 24 minutes of video. Uh, but it's important that you understand why we're going to go and be doing this.